Matthew 5, verse 23. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Tell me if you have it. Now, I'm just going to follow up just on a few things. Uh, David Ravenhill shared last week uh, on vertical and horizontal forgiveness. And uh, if you miss that, uh, you know, it's good online, but it's better when you're in person. How many of you know that to be true? And um, I want to follow up on that for a moment for us. Uh, and I'll use this scripture here. It said... Uh, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, something's not right with that relationship. I, I need to know who's listening. Okay, and uh, your brother or sister has ought against you. Um, he said, leave your gift there at the altar and go your way, and then be reconciled. Do your best, basically, to build a bridge of love. Okay, so leave your gift at the altar, go your way, and King James says, first, be reconciled to your brother or sister, make sure there is a bridge of love there, then come and offer your gift. And he goes on in verse 25 to talk about uh, the adversary in terms of understanding dynamics of forgiveness. So uh, let me just share some of this. This goes all the way back uh, to uh, married people. Uh, goes anyone who knows you have, someone has an ought against you or there's a problem with a relationship within your life. Now, uh, before I married Tina, she was my sister in Christ. And so he's uh, speaking to us in terms of understanding forgiveness that if someone has a gift that you're presenting to him, whatever it might be, he said, I want you first to go and be reconciled. Make sure that you've done your best to build a bridge of love with that individual that you know has, has an ought against you. Go and be reconciled. Do your best to make sure there is a bridge of love there. Don't get up here, Steve, and begin to preach and use your gift and begin to use words of knowledge if you have someone in your life that you know has ought against you and you haven't done your part to go to them. Who's listening? Uh, now, it doesn't mean you're going to be best friends. Doesn't mean necessarily whomever it is. Uh, he's not telling you you're going to be best friends or that you're going to hang out together after church. He's making sure we under, understand the dynamic of your gift and how important it is to, to uh, leave that at the altar and to deal with horizontal relationships in your life. Too many leaders, too many people operating in their gift and not taking care of basic principles within God's word. Even uh, today, Sunday, I think it was Friday, one of my old basketball, uh, I was a college coach, he called me up and uh, he saw one of the YouTubes. He's in uh, Los Angeles, California. 
he came to the university I was coaching at and uh, began to share Jesus with him and would pray with him and, and would take these young kids into our home and uh, feed them and nourish them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this particular young man ended up giving his life fully to Jesus Christ, and he was on staff with the largest church in Los, a in Los Angeles. 33,000 members. Now, he called up finding me in tears because some things happened between the leader and him and he is no longer, he's got uh, two children, he's no longer on staff there. I shared with him, you need to make sure that you are reconciled, you've done your part to make sure there is a bridge of love there that you have no bitterness in your heart. Again, it goes the same with married people, with anyone in your life. Who's going to allow the Word of God to challenge you today? Amen. Now, that being said, uh, that being said, uh, in this house, if you're an elder, if you're a deacon, uh, you have a higher responsibility in the principles of God's Word. Amen. Your Bible points that out. Anytime you are, you are called into certain dynamics of leadership, you have a higher responsibility. Okay. Uh, you have three days to clean up some area that needs reconciliation. If you are in any type of leadership as an elder or a deacon here, I want to strongly press this issue. You have three days to clean it up. You can't be in this church and you're not talking to someone in this church because you have ought against them or they have an ought against you. That's good. <laughs> Getting hot early, isn't it? <laughs> There's a higher responsibility. Three days to clean it up. You may not be best friends, but you can't operate any longer as a true Christian and allow those that you know have ought against you and you against them and somehow leave to feel like this is okay. No, 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 no. God doesn't operate that way and we have to quit operating that way. Now, the second level of... Uh, Leadership, anyone who is involved in any type of leadership in this church. Going to the prisons, prayer team, deliverance team, media team, children's help, any type of ministry at all. We give you one week. <laughs> you get seven days to clean it up. Seven days. Well, why seven and how come them three? Because really it should be quickly get it done. But we're endeavoring to give grace to those that possibly maybe aren't as spiritually strong yet. You have seven days again if there's anyone in this church and outside of this church where you're not talking to. That's got to stop. That means at least you build a bridge of love. You may not be bosom friends, but at least you could make sure they know, I do love you even though we disagree. But I want you to know in that disagreement, there's a bridge of love there. And I welcome you with a hug of fellowship and communion, no matter how this is in our lives. But I, I will not allow the no talk zone to continue in my life. It's better than the sermon, so you, you better just take it while you got it. <laughs> the third level is the congregation that is not involved at all in co-laboring. We want to move you from the living room into the kitchen and get you working, beloved. But in that, we're going to give you uh, two weeks. 
Now, I'm not going to go and, and uh, you know, send my drones out <laughs> to make sure you're cleaning stuff up, but carry that as a principle in your life and endeavor to make sure that as a Christian uh, that you're trying to live in a place of uh, forgiveness uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Turn to someone and tell them that was worth coming this morning. Go ahead and tell them. Secondly, uh, Romans 5 verses 3 and 4. I'm glad I'm in a church that loves their Bible. And I don't have to apologize. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Romans 5, verse 3. Tell me if you have it. Now, in Bible study, uh, we have begun to teach on character, and I just want to breeze by it for a moment because forgiveness is also uh, a dynamic of developing your character. Verse 3, tell me if you have it again. And so Paul, presumably the writer here, he's writing, he says, not only so, but we notice what he says in the King James, we glory in our, what's your Bible say? Tribulations. That means distress, trouble, heartache, disappointment, discouragement, pain in his life. Now, listen, beloved, how is he, how is he, how, uh, when he says here, we glory, it means that he is fully invested in the process with joy. Okay, so he's talking about the tribulation. Now listen, every one of us in here is going through some sort of tribulation somewhere. We have sins in common and we have tribulations. Can I have a good amen? So we're going through something and yet here, this one who has been through more severe, please listen, more severe tribulations than any of us have, he says, I have found a place in him that I have learned to glory and to somewhat revel in the process of the tribulations. In other words, I'm not just looking at what I'm going through. I'm knowing what God is wanting to do in my tribulations. So he's not just focusing on his pain of his marriage, pain of loneliness, pain of heartache. He's, he's focusing on the process that God is taking him through. Every tribulation that you and I are in, there is a dynamic divine, please listen, DNA that God is wanting to do in that tribulation. It's not just there because of there. Nothing is like that in his economy. That as you see the, the tribulation that you're in, if you and I can begin to glory in it, because look what he says, knowing. He knows something about tribulations, beloved. He says, knowing, King James says, that the tribulation is going to work what? Perseverance. In other words, something in the very economy of God wants to develop within me and in you what I call grit. Grit. Flat out grit. Uh, uh, someone, a Christian who doesn't roll over because you had your first marital spat. Some of these young kids, oh, I'm, I want to get married, I want to get married, I want to get married. Two weeks after the honeymoon, they're on my doorstep knocking on the door. Complaining about it, you wanted to get married. You pray God bring her and him to me. It wasn't too long ago. This is a true story. It's, uh, a gentleman knocked on my door at three in the morning. I come out there, I pack in my judge. Who is that? Between Jesus and this gun, someone's going down. I, I did, three o'clock. I opened that door, I'm like, what are you doing here? Tears. Oh, this is, this is, come on in. You think pastoring's just this? This, no, this isn't that. Listen to me. You think that's this? This is, this is not, this is not pastoring. Listen to me. This is not pastoring up here. This is teaching Bible. Shepherding. You're taking the staff and you're endeavoring to pull people out of the mud. 
pull them out of there. The sheep have wandered off, gotten into tribulations. You're putting that staff in and say, come on in Jesus' name, come out of there. He's wanting, listen, beloved, to produce some grit in us. Christians that don't roll over and begin to say, I'm done with God. Where's he at? Paul says, I revel in the tribulation, knowing that in it, first thing he's going to produce is some divine grit in my life. That if you want anything God has for you, please listen to me. It's going to call for perseverance and grit in your life. Listen, nothing valuable in this world, in God's economy, is going to come easy for you. Ah, who's listening? Nothing that God has for you, your marriage, your relationships, your body, uh, kingdom, resource, and finance, and the host of all of that, nothing's coming easy without perseverance, without dog-eared grit. You better listen to that and tuck it away back here. And realize and ask God to help me and you that in the midst of your tribulation. You begin to glory knowing that he's trying to produce grit in my life. That grit will take you a long ways. All you have to do is outlast the devil. You have to outlast the devil. He came and pounded Jesus and brought forth temptation after temptation after temptation and only listed four of them. He had temptations all through his life. And the devil said, I'll have to return at a more opportune time. You just have to outlast the devil in your tribulation. Why? Knowing it's going to produce grit in my life. Turn to someone and tell them, don't quit. Come on, tell them again, don't quit. If you've been married longer than 20 years, let me see your hands. Yeah, there's some gritty people right up in here. Turn, turn and tell them there's some gritty people in your midst. Now look what he says. Taking too much time with this, but it's pretty good. I said it's pretty good. And verse 4 he says, And let perseverance, it's going to work character in your life and character will give birth to hope and hope makes no man or woman ashamed because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. It's going to produce grit and then it's going to produce that within the character of my life. See what you missed in Bible study? This is remix two. Listen, Say this with me. Character. Character. Say it with me again. Character. Character. This young man that, that called, he said to me, if I were to tell you the names that he's been brought underneath, you'd know exactly who they are. He said to me, is anybody saved? Why? Because he saw behind the veil. He saw behind the veil. And this young man called up crying. He says, Pastor Steve, is is anybody saved? Wow. Why? Because he didn't see much character. He didn't see much character. Dokamos, Greek, character. Listen, it means to stand on trial. You're going through tribulation. Your character is on trial. Say that again. You're going through tribulation knowing this. I will glory in my tribulation knowing it's going to produce grit in my life and grit is going to produce something of character in me. Dakamos, it is on trial. What does that mean? That means you will find a lot about your character in the midst of your tribulation. Problems reveal who you really are. Dakamas on trial. It means also to be proven. 
Let me ask you, how are you handling your trials, your tribulations, your pain, your heartache? How are you managing that? Because it does have a reflection on your dakamas, on your character. I don't want to counsel any more people that continue when trials come, and I've taught the principles for 10 solid years, 1,300 messages over there, catch up. And I tell you, they're coming. I tell you, the trials are coming. Why? Because you live in an age, an hour, where this is a demand that character must stand trial and it must be vindicated. And now you get hit in the face and now you head down and all we're seeing is some drinking themselves silly, chasing skirt. See some smoking, snorting, licking, biting. You don't want me to tell you the pastoral realm I'm in, do you? <laughs> Rather than humbling ourselves, listening to me, who's listening to me, humbling ourselves before Jesus Christ and pouring my heart and hurt out to him and allowing him to put perseverance in me and to put grit in me and to develop my character before the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't compound your tribulation by more sins. Clean up one, and guess what? I find out you did that one. Yeah. Now it brought that person in. Listen to me now. I'm just going everywhere. Sin is messy. Yeah. No man or woman lives or dies to themselves. If I commit sins, you're going to get hit by it. It's going to splatter. You glad you came? Jeez, getting rough up in here, aren't I? I better stop. Good grief, look at that. Gonna get dangerous up in here. Turn to someone and tell them, God's growing your character. Come on, tell them. Paul said to the Philippian church, I am sending you Timothy shortly. He will be a comfort to you, a good comfort to you, for I have no man like-minded who cares for your state. For all others I know, they seek their own desires, but Timothy seeks the things which are Jesus Christ. And you know when I send him, listen to what he says, I have proven him, character is the Greek word, dakamos, I have proven him. That as a son with the father has served, served me in the gospel. Every minister should prove their sons. Every ministry should prove their daughters and their sons. Too many leaders, you done with my rant? Too many leaders not proving their daughters and their sons. I can go on and on and on and tell you the, the largest churches here and here that I know personally, the third man in charge is sleeping with women. Third one in one of the largest churches in America, sleeping with ladies. Drunk more than he's sober. Now, I don't know how to pastor 30,000. I got enough trouble with 300. Hello, somebody. So I'm not asking for that. 
But I am saying, you should know your top 12. I said, you should know your top 12 leaders and sons and daughters, and you should be looking under the skirt, looking under the sheets, finding out what in the H-E double toothpicks are you doing? Oh, it's a wrong group. It's a wrong group for this. I want to know who you sleeping with. I want to know what are you doing when church is over. I want to know where are you going in your nighttime. I want to know, I want some information for you. If you're in this ministry and I'm accountable for you and you tell me you go to that church and I see this and I hear this and I see that picture, that's not going to roll up in here. It's a Gideon revival. It'll be a Gideon revival. If you're a leader, a deacon, and an elder, top tier leader in this church, how many days you got to get stuff right? If you're second tier where you're involved in any ministry in this church at all, changing diapers back there, any ministry at all, how long you got to get your stuff clean? If you're the third tier where you're here and we're grateful for you, but you're not involved in any of the ministry, how long you got to get your stuff clean? The tribulations you're going through, what is it beginning to do in your life that your word says? It's developing grit in your life. And the grit is going to develop what? It's on trial. So when you're going through that and you're flipping your wife off, you're F-bombing her, that is what I'm talking about too since we're here. Amen. Now some of you are so pure, you can't, and I, and look, I bless you with it, but I'm dealing with them. And I'm letting you know ahead of time, that can't keep going on. You got children listening to you. They're looking for a model and this is how you're going to roll this out and now they're going to follow you. I, I, where's Deacon Bob. Lock the doors. <laughs> Turn the heat up. <laughs> you know, my first university coach, Navy SEAL. His name was, and I'll tell you, his name, Prescott Smith. This guy. Now, I'm 18. I'm thinking I'm all that in a bag of chips. I'm walking into campus like this. I like, I got a basketball... See, some of you are so young, but there's a song called Basketball Jones. Basketball Jones, I got a basketball Jones. Elmer's in my age, so he's the only one that knows the song. The rest of you are so young. It's Prescott Smith, a Navy SEAL. He locks the gym doors with locks. Chains with locks. This is my first practice. He flips the heat on. It had to be as hot as Kuwait. 140 in there. And then he says, we're just going to run. I wanted to show him how good I am. Let me show you. I'm Basketball Jones. Now this man got saved. But he wasn't when I was there. He got up right in my face. And out came language, I don't think even sailors <laughs> No, I'm like, oh, Jesus. He said, you're going to follow me. He ran with his arms up. We ran for two hours straight. And if he saw your arms drop, his nickname was Puck, Puck Smith. He come back. Here comes the Navy SEAL. Now some of the fellas that ran from the law, they knew what to do. I mean, I had that one time, but that was all I needed to learn that lesson. Why am I telling you that story? I don't know why. Anything to do with character, grit, uh, f foolishness. Lock the door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah. Stuff's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, give the Lord a praise. All right. All right. All right. I am redeemed. You say.
set me free.